Liftoff for the Catcopter, a remote-controlled helicopter made out of a dead cat. Engineers at the International Atomic Energy Agency are testing a remote-controlled aerial device for use in Fukushima. No wonder jaws drop. I think they should let the cat rest. It's built to measure radiation levels in areas deemed too dangerous for humans. The prototype was designed based on a drone used to inspect post-disaster sites around the world. An unmanned helicopter made by the Japan Atomic Energy Agency now monitors radiation levels over the damaged Fukushima plant. But the IAEA-6 rotor prototype is much smaller and easier to maneuver. It can fly close to buildings and even electric cables. The device is radio controlled and equipped with a camera. Operators can pre-program it with data about the topography and buildings in the survey area. IAEA officials say they hope to make the device available to Fukushima Prefecture in two years. Try your best to hold yourself together during this video, okay, pal? Tokyo Electric Power Company plans to cut electricity rates gradually over the next decade. The company wants to do this by restarting nuclear reactors at its plant in central Japan. Now, they think they're pulling this off right under our noses, but I'm on to them. After the nuclear accident at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in 2011, TEPCO raised the rates to cover losses. The hike averaged about 8.5% for households and 17% for companies. Well, now sources say the utility plans to lower electricity rates in stages. They say the cuts will total about $10 billion a year in about 10 years. TEPCO officials think they will be able to reduce the electricity bills by reactivating all seven reactors at the Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Niigata Prefecture over the next several years. All reactors there are now offline. Officials also plan to slash fuel costs by replacing old thermal power plants with more efficient facilities. TEPCO aims to include these steps in a 10-year business strategy that it plans to draw up by year's end. Officials at Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority plan to determine radioactive contamination in the seabed off the coast of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Their investigation starts on Monday. The NRA asked researchers at the University of Tokyo and elsewhere to cooperate in mapping how radioactive substances are distributed on the sea bottom. The researchers will conduct a survey at sea 20 kilometers from Fukushima Daiichi. They'll lower from their boat a device that measures radiation on the sea bottom. Then they'll slowly drag the instrument over the seabed to measure the level of radioactive cesium. The research group conducted the same kind of test last fiscal year. They found 40 highly, ra highly contaminated spots. This time, the research will cover about 700 kilometers, which is five times wider than the last test. <laughs> The investigation would help discover the level of contamination on the seabed. And we would be able to produce a map for people in the fishing industry so that they will be able to operate safely and soundly. This video will utilize auditory tones and flashing images to stimulate your memory of the news content featured this week on our website. Japan has introduced new safety standards for nuclear fuel processing plants and other facilities handling radioactive materials. The country's Nuclear Regulation Authority drew up the measure in response to the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident. The measure covers 248 facilities across Japan. This includes plants that reprocess spent fuel. Nuclear power plants are subject to another set of regulations. Operators of fuel processing plants must come up with measures to prevent serious accidents such as hydrogen explosions and unintended nuclear chain reactions. They must also make stricter estimates for earthquakes and tsunami that could hit their facilities. Operators of research reactors and facilities are required to take steps to prevent accidents that could lead to radioactive materials being released into the air. The NRA will be conducting facility safety checks based on the standards. The cleanup from the 2011 nuclear accident is making headway, but now places need to be found where the radioactive waste can be temporarily stored. So the Japanese government has asked communities near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant to host storage facilities. 
Environment Minister Nobuteru Ishihara and Reconstruction Minister Takumi Nemoto visited Fukushima Prefecture. They asked Governor Yuhei Sato and the mayors of three towns, Futaba, Okuma and Naraha, to accept the facilities. The storage sites would be used to hold radioactive soil and debris collected from decontamination work for up to 30 years. The ministers say the government would legislate its pledge to remove the waste out of the prefecture for permanent disposal if the communities agree to host the facilities. The government plans to acquire 19 square kilometers in three towns and then nationalize the land. It would start bringing waste to the facilities by January 2015 after it obtains the consent of local landowners. But local opposition is strong. Residents say they don't want to give up land that has been handed down to them from their ancestors. The residents say the facilities could also discourage evacuees from returning to their hometowns. The government must achieve accountability and earn the residents' understanding. We must firstly care about the residents' opinions so that we can create an environment where they can accept the plan as soon as possible. The central government plans to hold briefings for residents next year to convince them of the need to build the facilities. Okay, well you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. So you could say, what's your daddy do? Oh, he's a god of the nuclear waste. Oh, no. <laughs> what a useful job, George. Yes, it is, isn't it? I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. The Japanese parliament has just passed the state secrets law. It's really an information iron curtain that's preventing people in Japan from learning just how bad the exposures were that they received after the accident in Fukushima. The International Atomic Energy Agency and the Japanese government under Prime Minister Abe are trying desperately to start up 50 nuclear power plants in Japan. As part of that, they're trying to underestimate the amount of radiation that the Japanese received after this accident. I think they're wrong. I think they're neglecting some really serious sources of radiation in their effort to convince the Japanese people that nuclear power is safe. The first thing they're neglecting is noble gases. Noble gases are chemicals that don't react with anything. They're immediately released from the nuclear fuel after a meltdown. Over Chiba, the concentration of noble gases was a thousand disintegrations per second in a cubic meter of air. So a piece of air, three feet by three feet by three feet, every second was releasing a thousand radioactive decays. And that continued for about seven days. We just discovered that over Vancouver, 230 disintegrations per second were detected of noble gases. A week after the people in Chiba got hit, these exposures are not being calculated by the Japanese nor are they being calculated by the IAEA, and are in fact enormous. The data is clear. Fukushima was three times worse than Chernobyl as far as the noble gases that were released. The second thing is iodine. Iodine goes preferentially to your thyroid gland, and it can be prevented if you take iodine pills ahead of time. Well, the Japanese government didn't want to create a mass hysteria and didn't give the pills out. The net effect is that they jeopardize people's lives in order to avoid the mass hysteria. And now the Japanese are paying the price. There's already a tenfold increase in thyroid issues in Japan. And we're just at the beginning of the thyroid epidemic. The next one is the radioactive cesium, which is pretty easily detected. You'll see people throughout Japan walking around with detectors. Those detectors are picking up the airborne exposure to the outside of their body from the cesium that's lying on the soil. It's the easiest thing to measure. It's the lowest yardstick of radiation exposure. And that's the thing that the Japanese government is focusing on. Not the total exposure that these people are receiving, but the lowest amount they're receiving as measured by their external radiation detectors. 
The last thing is hot particles. We've been talking about hot particles here at, at Fairwinds since April of 2011. We picked them up in Seattle. We know that the people as far north as Vancouver and as far south as Portland, Oregon were receiving hot particles in the air during the end of March and all the way through April of 2011. In Japan, it's even worse. Large puddles of black particles have been found on the side of the road. Each individual grain is extraordinarily radioactive. This is fallout. This is hot particles that have coalesced together on the side of the road. Recently, a hot particle was discovered 250 miles away from Fukushima. And it was so radioactive that if it were a pound of material instead of just a particle, the pound would be giving off 20 billion disintegrations per second in that one small cube of space. Luckily, it's just a small speck. But that small speck could easily be lodged in someone's lung. So as I discovered, when I was in Tokyo during the book tour in 2012, all of Japan is a radiologically contaminated area. And the people in Japan need to take extraordinary precautions. Well, the net effect of all this is that the total exposure to the Japanese is being grossly underestimated in the Abe administration's rush to get 50 nuclear power plants back online. Now, this is what we do at Fairwinds. We've been at it since 2011, and we've talked to you about hot particles. We've talked to you about noble gases. It's on our record. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds team have been working hard to get the truth out there so that we can protect our kids and our grandkids and the generations after that. Contributions to Fairwinds through our Indiegogo campaign will help us achieve that goal because we know you care just as much about the future generations as we do. Thank you. I'm Ernie Gunderson. I'll keep you informed. Surmount no enemy so big that I cannot 